And with me right now is Mr. John Myler. What's going on, my friend? Hello. Uh, I just thank you for being able to come on your show. Uh, an author, I write these books. They're kind of unusual. They don't really fall into any particular category as far as following a stereotype. Uh, unusual content that I write about. That you do. And what's pretty wild is... You know, John, I always wonder how anyone finds this program. But the weird thing is, well, I shouldn't say it's weird. The, the most fascinating thing is I actually heard you way back in the year 2000 with Art Bell. So I find it rather interesting that you contacted me first. I was actually wondering about you maybe two years ago to this date. Exactly on this month, maybe even on the same day, to be honest with you. No, no lies. So I find wow. that pretty, pretty amazing, to be honest. So the synchronicity is already flying. That's cool. So you had to yeah. be here. This, this was supposed to happen. Yes, I believe so. I fully uh, believe that. Yeah. Yeah, pretty I'm a, wild. I'm a student of prophecy. Uh, that's part of what I write about. It's kind of funny, my story. Uh, what yeah, you, got me into that's right. You, writing. you have a rather interesting story, John, and I, I definitely want to get into your little bit of your background here before we really get into things here and of course you you are sort of into uh, I guess like a little I shouldn't say it's a, your own little genre but there are but there are other people that sort of follow the same line of rationale as you do now now yes but back in 2000 not many how many people were into ufology that were Christians. Right. So you were, uh, exactly, it was a little unheard of back in those days, and now everyone's sort of caught up to what you were talking about uh, 24 years ago, basically. Yeah. Pretty wild, John. Take us down the rabbit hole. Yeah, so when I was five years old, um, I was at my great-grandmother's house, and there was a family gathering. I believe it was around Christmas time. So there was a lot of family members there. My dad, his aunts, uncle, my mom. Um, both my parents were divorced when I was a baby, but they were there on this occasion together. And um, with all of these people milling around the house and all the talking and different conversations going on simultaneously and you know, it's kind of mayhem, uh, my grandmother's sitting on the couch and reading a newspaper and then she sets the newspaper down and says, okay, everybody, I have something to say to the whole family. And everybody's like, wow, uh, Grandma Thelma's going to make an announcement. So she's the patriarch of the family at that time. Um, she and my great-grandfather. Um, so to tell you a little bit about her, she, what you would call in today's language, a holy roller. Mm. Came from the Bible Belt. Right. Uh, my grandfather, my great grandfather, was a, a minister. They traveled the United States. I believe they went to the, most of the forty-eight contiguous, you know, continental United States. Um, all through the Great Depression, the big tent revivals, all that. So they were all about Jesus and just had this seriously fervent, you know, faith in their life and everything about what they did and believed and said was about God and Jesus. Uh, if the music was playing in the house, it was going to be gospel. Mm. She knew how to play the piano, all gospel songs. If the TV was on, it was an evangelist. Um, they were just immersed, you know. So that was them. And then, of course, my dad's generation in the 1960s, he just totally rebelled and went off in his own thing. And, and my mom kind of the same. She's sort of this hippie. They were hippies. You know. Slightly. My mom was. Your, oh, my the dad mom was okay. Not so yeah, much. I don't know how to classify my dad. He's an intellectual for <laughs> ah. sure. Uh, but definitely, you know, like to joke about being a pagan uh, until much later in life. But um, anyway, not what you'd call church going people. Um, and then my mom's version of Jesus, more like, you know, uh, why did they kill him? You know, it's like if, if you're a Christian, you know why. They killed him. He allowed it to happen. He came here for that explicit purpose. But for her, it was more like, this dude was so awesome. He's such a good guy. Why'd they have to kill him? You know, it's like, okay. I get that she, you know, at least she had reverence for him. But um, yeah. anyway, we're all there in the house. Grandma drops his, you know, 
she she says, I have something to say. And then she picks up the newspaper and she starts to read this article about a wild goose chase between the police and a UFO hot rotting all around the countryside of Madeira. You could have literally copied and pasted this scene out of Close Encounters of the Third Kind because that's how that movie starts open, uh, starts out. And this was like a year or two before that movie came out. So I don't know if they referenced this scene, <laughs> that scene from what my grandmother read, but it was like a carbon copy of that scene in that movie. Uh, so there was this wild goose chase between a UFO and this cop car all around Madeira, and my grandmother's reading it, and everybody's like thinking, Grandma's reading about UFOs. Why? <laughs> it, you know, I mean, an angel sighted in the clouds or something would be more in line with the, um, you know, metaphor there with her, but she's mixing the metaphors up, and so people are, like, getting these kind of confused looks on their faces, like, why is Grandma reading a story about a UFO? Grandma was kind of cool. Yeah, she was. She was very cool. And then when she finished reading the story, she dropped a newspaper and she said, when I was a little girl, I saw a UFO. And everybody's just like, okay, continue, you know? Right, yeah, <laughs> you go on. You heard a pin drop, you know? <laughs> and right. uh, all, all that chatter was like completely silent. And uh, Grandma said that she and her older sister were out in the plains of Kentucky. This was during the turn of the century. So, you know, back then, what, 1910, something like that. And um, they were walking along where they lived. There was no civilization and there was no town. Neither of them had ever seen an automobile before. Uh, they had only seen wagons and horses. So they were out in the middle of nowhere. Um, and they saw a UFO. He said it was shaped like a cigar. And it flew right in front of them, broad daylight, about maybe 30 feet above the ground. It was this shiny, polished aluminum. None of them, neither of them had ever seen anything that was like a shiny, silvery aluminum like that before. And the top of it had a uh, glass bubble on top, and they were so close, they even saw the guy turn his head and look at him. Flew by. Wow. And... It went to these. It went over these bluffs, and as soon as it went over these bluffs, it just shot straight up in the sky and disappeared instantly. And they were like totally blown away. They were like, "Whoa, what was that?" You know, they had never even seen comic books, or they had no frame of reference. What was this? So they turned around and sprinted back home. Immediately told their mother, and their mother told them, "Don't ever tell anybody this." that you saw anything like this ever again. I don't want to hear another peep out of it from either of you ever. Done. End of story. And so they were kind of puzzled, you know, like, okay, well, you don't upset mom. Uh, so they kept it to themselves. And then my great grandmother's sister died shortly after that. So I, I didn't even know that my great grandmother had a sister at this point in time, you know. But here I found out she had a sister and she died. So that was something that I learned at that point, at that time. Yeah. But then Grandma had this crazy experience to herself all her life. And she basically buried it. And, you know, she had other experiences happen in her life before, other worldly type experiences. For example, she was once saved by an angel. She was choking to death from carbon monoxide poisoning, and an angel walked into the house and turned her over, and her description of the angel is interesting. She said he was a military-dressed dude with a pickle hob helmet. So that's weird. So Grandma had these interesting stories. Um, she even had a stroke when she was in her 50s, and it almost killed her, and she was in the hospital paralyzed. The left side of her body, she couldn't move it. And Jesus walked into her hospital room and smiled at her and healed her instantly. So the doctors were baffled because they were like, not sure if she would ever talk again, much less walk. Yet she was able to sit up and walk around and talk and everything like nothing ever happened. And then she would just gladly tell them, you know, Jesus came in here. He healed me. And um, so she had these kind of stories. And these are the kind of stories that you can understand, like, Okay, grandma's always talking about Jesus' stuff, so 
And this is part of why she was so on fire for Jesus, because, you know, he just did this amazing thing for her. But now she's talking about this UFO story. And everybody's like, how does that fit? And Grandma never really thought, saw any need to reconcile this other reality of outer space and whatnot with Jesus and her faith reality. To her, it's all real. And uh, so Grandma concluded her story by just dropping the newspaper and saying, you know what, I don't care what people think. Those things are real. And that just resonated with me so much. I mean, I was only five when I heard her say this, but I was like, wow. And they're just looking at everybody's faces around the rooms, like how shocking it was to everybody. And they didn't even know what to say. It was like, I don't know, it took a while before people start finally talking again and acting normal again. But I would just, I had all these question marks you could probably see visually flying off of my head, you know? And I was all questions to mom going home. <laughs> And we already watched Star Trek, so Mom used that as a bridge. Uh. She's like, well, you know the show we watched, Star Trek, kind of like it's a religion, you know? Mm. Um, there's probably more reality to that than most people think. And that's kind of how she summed it up. And I was like, you know what? That's got to be true, because Grandma doesn't lie. Right, you know? and Mom was open-minded, so, and she didn't tell you to stay away from Grandma, so that's one thing. Oh, yeah. I mean, she took me to Grandma's house. Yeah. And, and my mom was so open and hippie-ish. Right. Um, I was a spiritually inclined kid. So I took this this whole UFO thing and I'm like always wanting to know more, right? And asking and my sister has all these crazy stories too. Paranormal ghosts and things like that. I, so I became encyclopedic like a Fox Mulder, you know, as a teen. Uh, I collected books. I collected stories. I did ex I later ended up doing all these experiments and the paranormal, ghost hunting, and astral projection. But by the way, John, I'm sorry to interrupt you, but have you yourself had a personal encounter with a UFO or anything of that nature? Anything that would be considered, I guess you could say, paranormal of sorts? I know back, I, would, I think it was back in, what, 1988 when you experienced something out there, a glowing orb of sorts, I believe. Yeah. Uh, are we are we going a little too forward, by the way? Did we jump ahead? No, I mean we can go there. Um, so yeah, that and that's part of my story too. That. But before I had we get there, but events that happened, you know, right. when I was five. And well, okay, I, when you're five, that's when at first yeah. something happened. Okay, start there then. Yeah, well, that's when I heard my grandmother tell this story. Ah, okay. Uh, but being spiritually inclined, I think when people they don't just filter things out as much but they hear a noise in the other room they look over there they see no rational explanation for what could have caused that noise they don't just dismiss it that's me um i've always been that way and having dreams that are unusual and i write them down or you know whatever mm -hmm. uh, so i guess they have words for that now they say that you're sensitive or something like that you know but uh, I've always been that way, and so I got immersed into the, you know, the occult early on, doing all of these different things and experiments. And later in life, uh, when I was in the military, so I joined the Army active duty, and they sent us off to Panama during the Panamanian conflict. Ah, okay. And, and uh, I was an M60 gunner back then, 11 Bravo infantry. It's pretty badass. Mm -hmm. Right. <laughs> so uh they had a station at uh, Fort Sherman. Um and since there was no actual fence around the base, they wanted they wanted a perimeter of military out in that jungle, although you'd have to be insane to actually try to pin a, get to the base through the jungle. Um there was plenty of fence in my opinion. Uh that jungle is freaking inhospitable. Everything wants to kill you. Everything wants to bite you. Everything wants to sting you. Bugs, plants, everything. Um, not to mention they had uh, they had their own zoo uh, behind the base. You know, with the, they had a panther in there. They had a python in there. You know, all these creatures. And they're like, <laughs> these are all native here. So they used the zoo to train people on what to be aware, be careful about when going out into the jungle. And then they send us out in the jungle. So we're like, 
Oh, nice. <laughs> so I'm out in the jungle, and one of the things they didn't have in their little zoo was this uh, otherworldly transdimensional glowing ball of light. Right. How old were you at this <laughs> point, by the way? <laughs> so. Oh, by the way, John, about, how, how old were you, by the way? Sorry. I was, at um, this point. And it was 1990, so I believe I was 20. Okay, you're 20. Yeah. Okay. I was 20 at this time. And uh, in, in my barracks, I mean, I had this little miniature shrine. I had runes and candles and incense and uh, this huge library of paranormal books and stuff. People used to tease the hell out of me, right? Um, there's kind of a story with that, that on my first land navigation exercise, we were all sitting around with a lot of spare time and we're out there in the woods. And I'm thinking, you know, we don't have a campfire, but this is very much like a camping trip. The only thing we're missing is a ghost story. Uh, perfect. Yeah. And so <laughs> I, I pop off with this question. I asked my team leader, hey, have you ever seen a ghost? The guy about flipped out of his mind thinking I saw something, right? And, uh, and I said, no, no, I was just trying to ask. And they're like, the question to everybody was just so strange, you know? And I'm like, well, this is like a camping trip, you know? I'm trying to explain the relevance to them, but they're not tracking, you know? You're not looking at a, a large batch of intellectuals here. These guys talked about women and cars and, and drinking. Right. You know? Not very many subjects beyond that, right? Uh, pretty Neanderthal bunch here with me. And I have some Neanderthal in me too, you know? So... I could totally hang with these guys. Right. Uh, but I was kind of a nerd barbarian. So I had all these other interests. Yeah, you were and, a thinking man of sorts. <laughs> yeah, and uh, yeah, it didn't help me, especially in Panama when I said uh, I wasn't on board with collecting an ear necklace and doing all this other stupid stuff. And uh, I was thinking, you know, I'm like, I don't want to shoot anybody. And they heard me say that. They thought I was a conscientious objector. Oh, got no. Got me in a lot of trouble. And I'm like, Dude, somebody's shooting at me. I'll shoot back. Right. And I'm, I am got the guy on my left and right. You don't have to worry about me there, but I don't want to shoot someone. Don't you understand? Can't you comprehend that? I mean, were you ever, were, did they view you as a, like an issue of sorts, a bit of a they problem? Thought they thought you were. Yeah. And they're like, you're an M60 gunner, dude. You're the, you're supposed to be the source of carnage for our platoon. You can't talk like that. And I'm like, I'm only telling you that I'm a rational human being and I'm not just going to carte blanche, rip off and slaughter a whole bunch of people that I don't see armed, right? Right. And the more I talked about it, the more they got upset and nervous. And I'm like, okay, I just better just not try to explain anything and keep it to myself, you know, because <laughs> they didn't want to have that any kind of uncertainty. They just wanted a trigger happy person, I guess. I don't know. But, uh, <laughs> that was not me. I wasn't trigger happy. I was perfectly willing to, you know, defend and fight and follow orders and do what I had to do while I was there. I just wasn't enthusiastic about the idea of killing people. So, you know, sue me. <laughs> yeah, you're a rare breed. But, anyway. but I mean, not everyone <laughs> thinks that way. But I mean, during that time, most people... Uh, what you Infantry. were, it, yes, what yeah, you were doing, yeah. of course, it's just uh, shoot and ask questions later, basically, right? For the most Plus, part, I think a lot of it's just talk, it, you know, they they put up a show, but none of them had ever shot anybody up to that point, they don't know what it's like. They none of them were suffering with PTSD, or yeah, no one had any issues yet. yet. Yet, I was already foreseeing it, you know, I'm yeah. like, yeah, and I was thinking about it intensely, and they're like, do you think too much? Stop. Yeah. So <laughs> thinking thinking can get you killed in certain situations. It can, it can. You can't hesitate when you have to act. Uh but on this occasion I'm in the jungle. Um it's midnight. It's at the end of my shift. And the one guy who antagonized me the most, uh the corporal, my team leader, um, this guy made my life a living hell for like over a year, ever since the ghost story incident, because he was the one I asked the question to. And they nicknamed me and they constantly hazing me and, and just messing with me all the time oh yeah they uh, ribbed you for I a was, while i was weird right? yeah you're the weird guy <clears throat> so i'm sitting there and i see this they had sheet lightning going on the whole evening uh where the it's not really clouds but it's just this haziness mm -hmm. of the sky uh it's common in the jungle and there were like these sheets of fluttering light 
going across the sky. So it's like lightning going on above the clouds, and it just illuminates in this really kind of cool way. And that had been going on, so I was sort of tuning that out for the most part until I noticed that there was the same kind of light, but it was down below, below the clouds, in the jungle, in the trees. And uh, I'm like, wait a minute, that's a little brighter. What is that? And, you know, it was pretty much straight ahead, you know, maybe 600 meters away or so. You can't see that far in the jungle. It's not line of sight, but there right. was enough illumination that it was leaking through all of this foliage. And it kept getting brighter. <clears throat> About every 30 seconds or so, there would be this illumination. And eventually, I thought what I saw was a, like a little ball of light that was doing this. And um, I kept staring in the same direction, and about every 30 seconds, it would flash again, like a camera flash. And this thing was as bright as a camera. It was extremely bright, and it was getting closer and closer every time. It was making a beeline straight for our position. And I'm like, what is that? I, you know, there's, there's obviously no kind of vehicle that could be in there. Um, it's not an aircraft. It's down inside the trees, going through the vines and stuff. You know, uh, they didn't have drones back then. Um, who's going to be out in the jungle with a drone anyway? Uh, at a military base during war. It, it just, nothing's making sense anyway. Uh, so I'm curious and I'm seeing this thing approach. And I go and I wake up the corporal and I say, dude, um, time for your shift to get up. And by the way, there's this glowing ball of light over there headed our way. Um, thought you might want to know then i turned to go go to sleep right but i didn't think that uh, he would let me do that right because i'm just kind of poking him right <clears throat> and he's like what the hell are you talking about and i'm like i i don't know what it is uh, i've seen it it's a ball of light it's like pure energy and it flashes on and off and it's coming straight here but it's midnight and i'm super tired so i gotta go to bed and he's like, the hell you are. And he starts cussing me out. He's pissed off. And then he's like thinking that I'm making fun of him, uh, making it up, right? Because it's in the jungle. It's kind of creepy out there, yeah. right? Um, but uh, <clears throat> as he's ranting, and I'm like, just look for 30 seconds in that direction. And he thinks I'm trying to, you know, do a version of uh, your shoes untied, you know, or uh, your yeah. undone. Made you look, right? And he's not wanting to look, but out of his peripheral vision, he sees this flashing. What was that? I said, that was it. I'm serious. I'm not messing with you. Look this time. And he's looking, and sure enough, he sees it. And this thing keeps coming. And his eyes are getting wider and wider, and he's fidgeting, and he's kind of freaking out. Um, Like, what the hell is that? And I'm telling him, well, I've read about a lot of different things. And I could tell you that it's not ball lightning and it's not swamp gas. Like, you know, how do you know? And I'm like, well, I haven't confirmed that it isn't ball lightning yet, but to my knowledge, ball lightning doesn't flash on and off. It zips around until it hits something right. and dissipates. Um, unless it's a bunch of independent instances of ball lightning picking up where it left off, then no, that's that's too unlikely. Um this is, you know, and, and as I'm talking, the thing keeps getting closer and he's getting more and more nervous, you know, and uh, eventually it gets to be about maybe 30 feet away and it's 30 feet up in the trees and I see the actual size of it. This thing is like this big. It's the size of a soccer ball and it's pure electricity, like intense bright light uh, when it flashes on. And... uh so I was wearing my M60 with with 700 rounds, 750 rounds of ammunition. And I had my radio. We had a radio at our position, um, AM PVS 17, with the uh, lithium batteries, three spare lithium batteries, and a six-foot pole antenna leaning against a tree right there. And so I confirmed it again to uh, the corporal. I said, dude, if this thing were ball lightning, it wouldn't have stopped right there when it made it to our position. That's one oddity. Second oddity, here's a whip antenna. It's the equivalent of a lightning rod 
with all these batteries. These things should be attracting it. My weapon here, big chunk of metal, should be attracting it if it's electricity. Right, exactly. It's not. It's stayed there. Instead, it's acting like it's observing us, like a probe or some kind of life form. But the more I'm talking, the more scared he's getting. Right, right. And I, I, I said, uh, you know what? I don't want to give this thing the wrong impression. So I go over and I take my M60 off and he's like, what the hell are you doing? And I'm like, whatever the hell that is, it could have probably killed me by now. I don't want it to get the idea that I'm out here to do anything hostile to it. Uh, and then I told him, I'm going to try to communicate with it. And he's like, the hell you are. And I'm like, there's no way in hell I'm going to let go of this opportunity. I get to play James T. Kirk. For all the times I've seen that show, one of my dream come true is to initiate first contact with something otherworldly. And here was my opportunity. And you were going for it. And I'm going for it. <laughs> and I'm like, disobey a direct order. I'm like, yeah. I am going to communicate with it. Damn. He's telling me no. And I just walked right away from him straight toward this thing. And I went out into the middle of the clearing. And I said, whoever you are, I just want you to know who or whatever you are. I want you to know I come to you in peace. There's my weapon over there. I'm completely unarmed. I don't mean any hostile intentions to you. We're here for other reasons, not related to you. And this is your space. And I'm respectfully telling you that, you know, I don't mean you or any harm. And I am here in peace. Now, could you please let me know who you are? Or, or what you are. So, you know, it's this basic watered down version of, you know, greetings from Earth, you know. Um, and after I greeted it, it didn't flash. Like, according, like it disrupted the rhythm of that 30, every 30 seconds or so, like it's thinking. And, uh, and what like, were you feeling at that point? Were you scared at uh, all? Or, uh, I'm like, well, it. What did I do? Yeah. Uh, and suddenly this feeling came over me. And so I'll describe it as that feeling of being watched. Mm. So if you've ever been in a place where you know that there's something there, there's, yeah. you can't see it, but you know it's there and you know it's eyeballing you. And it might jump on you. I mean, it, it's, it's an intense um, instinctual feeling that you get when you feel it. Um, but it's a presence that you could feel. And I felt that feeling multiplied by like a thousand. Wow. Whatever this thing was, it was incredibly powerful. And it was watching you. And it was emanating its presence like I am here. And I could literally feel where it was. And then I felt it moving. I felt it moving straight toward me. And I'm like, Oh crap, oh crap. And I start walking backwards slowly uh, to, to the corporal and I'm saying, it's moving toward me. I don't know how I know, but it's moving toward me. I feel it moving. <laughs> and uh, I'm kind of panicking, but I'm trying to calm down at the same time because I'm like, you know what, I asked for this. Maybe it's gonna get closer just to be a little more personal. But, you know, I took the chance. So I finally stopped walking backward and I felt it going. And um, at the same time, I had these night vision goggles on. And PVS sevens. So I put them up to my eyes and I'm looking and I'm looking around and I am not seeing anything with these night vision goggles. And uh, as I'm looking through the goggles, I say, you know what? I feel it moving. I feel it moving. And I'm going like this and I'm changing my perspective. And I do a complete 180. This thing kind of lowered down a little bit and sailed right over the top of my head. I could feel it. Uh, and then I turned around, and then it went like 30 feet behind me. And it kind of nestled itself up in some tree branches in a very specific location. And uh, I said to the corporal, I said, I don't know how I know this, but the next time this thing flashes, it's going to flash right about there. Hmm. When I said the word there, it flashed like on cue. And it flashed exactly where I pointed. And I was still looking through the night vision when I 
when I pointed and said, there. And it, it blinded me because, you know, night vision amplifies the light. And I, I could see after that for a little bit. But, man, I got excited. And I, I turn around and I'm like dithering. And I'm like, did you see that? This thing is intelligent. Whatever that is, it's intelligent. It heard me. It communicated to me. Somehow it transmitted its position to me. And I don't know how it did that, but I knew where it was at. I could feel it. And it wasn't English. It wasn't speaking to me, but it communicated to me. And I was just going on and on and on. And I, he couldn't shut me up. And um, this thing proceeded to flash on and off, and it did a complete perimeter. Uh, or, around our position, like it circled our position, flashing periodically as it went until it did a complete 360. And then it went on down the trail, deeper into the jungle. There were two other positions down there, and it did the same thing to those two positions. I talked to the guys the next day, and they said, "Yeah, there was this weird thing that that we saw." Right. But they didn't want to talk more about it. They didn't want. Just, was this, uh, by the way, was this incident reported, by the way? Well, I was telling my team leader, right? Yeah, but they, and, they uh, reported. And so he was freaked out, right? Right. And uh, I went to bed. The next day I got up. That was the first thing on my mind. And then we regrouped with these other two groups. And I said, dude, tell me you saw that thing. It was headed towards your position. And they're like, what thing? You know, plain stupid. And I said, it was a glowing ball of light. It was about this big. And right. one guy said, oh, I think that was like a firefly. And mm. I'm like, really? This thing was the size of a soccer ball. It was not a fly firefly. There were fireflies all over the place. They kind of had a greenish tint. This was like a camera flash blinding light. And it was illuminating the whole jungle for hundreds of yards. It was super powerful and bright. And I I'm like trying to get get information out of these guys and all i could get was yeah we saw something and the more i rattled on uh corporal my team leader said i know what it is what what and he says you summoned it and they started laughing their asses off and it <laughs> and making fun of me right like I was a wizard, and yeah, I did some kind of magic yeah. spell, and then it just got went off on this stupid mockery tangent like they always did with me. And I'm like, don't you guys understand what happened? You saw something that's not in a biology textbook. This is not supposed to exist. That was alive, whatever that was. And the more I talked, the more they made fun of me. So I'm like, forget it. These guys are too lowbrow to even mean realize comprehend what happened they don't have yeah. a clue they don't have a clue wow so no i didn't go above them and report it to my chain of command probably but, probably good that you didn't yeah i don't know how that would have come back well they would have gave you a psych test of swords <clears throat> oh yeah probably try to get rid uh, of you I was already on thin ice as it was right you know, so i, I yeah okay. i understand so now he's talking to glowing balls of light you know and, yeah so i'm just trying to put the other guys under the under correct the screws and then they would probably deny they ever saw anything and yeah they throw yeah. you under the bus yeah yeah i understand a chance to get rid of them you know for sure. <laughs> I, yeah, that would be, my goodness. Uh, no, they wouldn't want to get rid of me. I was a source of entertainment. Yeah, they, they liked you, obviously. That's why they ribbed you so much. Uh, yeah. they, they, you know, if they didn't care about you, they wouldn't have uh, made fun of you so much. <laughs> That's how it was back in the day. Well, we'll, st we'll say that. <laughs> there you go. <laughs> awesome. So, but yeah, what a great experience to have, though, especially being... I, in a very foreign land, and then you see one of these sort of things out there that you have no idea what it was, and obviously yeah. it scared the hell out of you. So I, I was uh, uh, in a small little group back mm -hmm. then. We played Dungeons and Dragons, and we really got into this game. This was a fourth gener or no third generation game. They they did everything in the books, which I had most of the books memorized. I knew all the hit charts and everything. I could tell you all the character classes and. You know, roll the dice to tell you whether you got them or not, how many points of damage, whatnot. So, yes, Nerdville. Uh, but I was with, like, three other guys, and we were a part of this Dungeons & Dragons group, uh, and we would have these marathon games and stuff. And then, of course, I had the Monster Manual, the Deities and Demigods, and all these books in my head, which is a huge collection of 
supernatural entities. Uh, Gary Gygax was a big fan of um, comparative religions and, and ancient lore and legends and stuff. So he did a lot of research to write these. So there's some grain of truth in, in uh, some of that stuff. And I remembered reading about Willow the Wisp. And I was like, you know what we saw? We saw Willow the Wisp. That is a, a creature that tries to get you curious to follow it. They actually show one in the cartoon Brave. Uh, it's a CGI cartoon. Cartoon, yeah. About this, uh, you know, apparently the Will of the Wisp are like common in Ireland and Scotland and whatnot. And my heritage is Scottish. Um, so, <clears throat> anyway, uh, I, I read the description. They they actually are known for leading people out into the jungle and and then you fall in a pit, die. So some sort of. There's a lot of different, a lot of different cultures have these folklore of these entities, yeah. uh, pretty, pretty fascinating stuff. And actually, you know, talking about this sort of thing, uh, in the email, by the way, that you sent me, it says the Bible talks about UFOs quite a bit, but what I have to say isn't the typical mantra we've all heard from Giorgio Sukolos. And I, I yeah. like that. It seems like you took a little bit of a shot there about the TV show, Whoa. ancient aliens. And, yeah. uh, I, you know, I've spoken to the few people uh, that work there. A couple guests have been on oh, here cool. from the TV show. And, of course, I had the narrator of the program uh, of Ancient Aliens here on this program as well. He's, oh, wow. he's been here before. Yeah, the, the guy that does the voiceover. I've tried to contact him multiple times. They, they won't even reply to me. They don't talk but to I'm you. I'm like, are you ever interested in having an actual Christian on your show? You know, just give me a ring. You know, I've been studying and researching for 30 years, so. Um, big difference between me and and their crowd. Yeah, I was gonna say, what what exactly is it about ancient aliens that you uh, dislike? Well, I, I'm <laughs> you know I'm not a I'm not a, a big fan of the program. There's a lot of things I don't like, and I even expressed this to the producer of the program when I ate lunch with him. Uh, you know, he after that talk, you know, he didn't want to be on the show anymore. He oh, didn't wow. want to he didn't want to talk to me at all after that. You know, so you know, I Man. said things that are real. And I, I, you know, I didn't, I didn't hold back. And this was back in like 2016. Well, I'd be curious to know what you said. I said all yeah. kinds of things. I said, the show is an embarrassment. I said, what the hell is going on? Why would you have this cowboys and aliens nonsense because of the movie? And of course he's giving me the whole spiel about, well, it's a promotional thing. I wasn't there when this happened. And yeah, I'm looking oh. at you, William Henry, if you listen to this program and I know somebody will tell you, which is the way this works. Uh, but yeah, I'm not afraid to say that here because, uh, you know, I mean what I say sometimes, even though I do like to entertain, but this isn't one of those times I was shooting basically, oh, uh, yeah. you know, I'm shooting straight and that's what I did. And I wasn't afraid to tell him what I thought, but of course yeah. that rubbed him the wrong way and probably made his perception of me was probably that I'm like an a-hole or something, but you know, yeah. not everyone's going to be kind of soft, uh, whenever it, people are soft these days, you know, and sometimes you got to break yeah. a few eggs to make an omelet, John. Well, you yeah, they they kind of like take pop shots at Christians. Um, typical thing, you know, that, you know, we we are mistaking uh, ETs for being God. Right, right. They, they'll just, he practically chants that every episode. Um, now, they won't whisper a hint of criticism to a religion like Islam. They will not mention Muhammad. Uh -huh. show. Okay. I don't know if you've noticed that. I kind of did. They're selective in their criticism when it comes to taking a pop shot at somebody's faith. Christians are just idiots. They're, they don't know, you know, they're confusing an otherworldly reality for being ETs. But then they'll quote the Bible and they'll say, look, you know, uh, Elohim said, let us make man in our image. And that's actually what happens. A, a, a race of aliens came here and created humanity. They seeded us on the planet and such. Keep in mind, though, John, a lot of these folks in, in that world, that's very L.A., by the way. It's very Hollywood, the people that put on oh, yeah. these programs. So you got to remember, these people are ultra-liberal. Uh -huh. So they're not going to talk about Muhammad to any degree, any sort oh, no. of and say any no, sort no, of bad they, light. They, they, they have their, their lanes that they stay in, and uh, you will not get them to deviate from those lanes. Uh, but one of their favorite lanes is to kind of kick Christians around and make fun of them because they, they you know, well, for a certain part, uh, I can understand why you might want to kick a fundamentalist around. Who's, sure. You know, 
thumping somebody over the head with a Bible or whatnot. Perhaps it's the you know, evangelicals. Being, I, I think maybe, uh, sorry, John, I was going to say, maybe it's the evangelicals that maybe perhaps some people uh, truly dislike, and maybe that's like the stereotypical quote unquote Christian. You know, when they label someone, they, yeah. people think automatically like, oh, he's so and so. Right. Uh, you catch my drift they put a here. Label. Yeah. They they think that that applies to everybody. Right. Um, you know, but but the the whole genetic thing, uh, that humanity was seeded here that that feeds into you know a direct attack on the identity of God. You know, so basically, the Bible clearly states in Genesis two twenty seven that God created humanity. He formed Adam and Eve. You know, Adam from the dust of the earth. So that is a clear reference right there that we're a God created species. Um, they take the word Elohim and they say, oh, well, that means, you know, it's a, it's a plural word. So they run with that, you know. Um, of course, there's other scriptures that that you you need to put it in context. You know, this is the same God in Genesis 1 1 who created the heavens and the earth. It wasn't aliens that created. The heavens and the earth aliens didn't exist outside of time space they can't exist outside of time space all of creation is covered in genesis 1 1 in the beginning god created the heavens and the earth so nothing existed prior to this so god's identity right is unique would you it's, say that god is an alien alien to us foreign so something else god the father jesus said no one has seen this father except him so he's referring to god outside of time space and god entered his creation through the person of jesus so jesus is the physical manifestation of god in this universe even in the old testament so that's that's an interesting thing that people don't really think about that much that when god entered this uh, existence he entered like roughly 2,000 years ago, through the person of Mary, God, outside of time space, spoke a seed into Mary. She had a child. God then had a physical body in this universe. After he died and was resurrected again and ascended to heaven, he had a physical body at that point. Then he traveled back into time and created humanity. So he, he has a physical body, but it somehow defies time because it existed before he was born. Well, that's because God is outside of time. That's why he used the, the identity, I am. He said before Abraham was, I am, which defies time. He's always present wherever he is. So he can bounce around in time wherever he wants, and he can exit time altogether. He's at one with his father outside of time space. So these are concepts that aliens, they can't claim that. Aliens are created beings. So that's one big difference between me and them. Uh, your your typical ancient alien crowd is that I take God. I'm like, and you know, God is who He is. He's He. If I am the Lord is a phrase that's said so often in the Bible. It's because God is really trying to make the point. And the Bible also says in Revelation fourteen six that in the end times there's going to be a lot of confusion about God's identity. Mm. So there's an angel that's flying in the heavens. It's announcing to the earth, you know, worship him who created the heavens and the earth and all the things that are in them. Uh, but there's a confusion about, okay, who's, you know, and this is something that if, if aliens show up, it's going to confuse a lot of people. Do you think we're in the end times yeah. now, John, or uh, entering them soon? Well, we have been in the end times ever since the cross, technically. Uh, but that word soon in the biblical sense, it's like taking this long time, two thousand right. years soon, in our opinion. Uh, but you know, you see all these these uh, prophecies that are happening left and right. Um, every prophecy that Jesus said had to happen before he returned has happened already. So there were three hundred prophecies that had to occur that are related to Jesus himself that predate Jesus's birth. Like 300 prophecies in the Old Testament, they all came to pass through Jesus. I mean, everything about him, where he was born, the time he was born, um, the fact that they were going to try to kill him, the way he was murdered, 
the fact that they were gambling over his clothes, all these details, 300 different prophecies all came true with him. Then he said all these other things about what was going to happen uh, after he left. And so everybody, even back then, was thinking, okay, he's going to return you know, in my lifetime. But he pretty much made it clear that it's not going to happen soon. There's going to be wars and rumors of wars. There's going to be an increase of knowledge. You're going to see signs and wonders in the heavens. We're going to return to the days of Noah. So there was a whole list of things that he mentioned, and a lot had not happened when he said these things. Um, Israel becoming a nation again was another prophecy that happened, and as unlikely as that was, this nation, gone for 2,000 years, suddenly, boom, it's here now. Uh, and not only that, the ancient language that they spoke, Hebrew, that was a dead language. I mean, what would be the likelihood of the United States speaking Cherokee in 10 years? Probably uh, not likely. Pretty unlikely, yeah. but even, even less likely than that is what happened in Israel, because that language was 2,000 years dead, and yet they resurrected it. It was actually a man and his wife who got together, and they started a school, and there was such a fervor throughout the nation to learn that language again. Now it's their national language. So they resurrected a dead language. So these kind of things are like prophecy happening. Right. We see all kinds of stuff happening now. All kinds of interesting, uh, interesting things are occurring right now in yeah. real time. And, uh, you know, we're, we're barely just starting off the year. We're only like almost four months now in the year. I, I still consider this very new. And I feel like something major is going to happen uh, quite soon in, within this year. Yeah. You know, we're already I seeing, so. a, yeah, we're already seeing this uh, global conflict going on. And you mentioned Israel. What exactly are your thoughts and opinions on Israel currently right now? If you don't mind me asking, John. No, no, I don't. Uh, the whole book, uh, The Strong Delusion, and, and I also talked about it in Aliens and the Antichrist, which um, Christian UFOlogy, that book is the second edition to Aliens and the Antichrist. Right. I talk about all this chaos in the Middle East that's going to keep building. Um, I talk about what country the the Antichrist is going to come out of. I believe it's going to be Syria. Um, mm. Syria, possibly Lebanon, but more likely Syria. The, Interesting. Daniel's, Daniel's visions basically narrowed it down. He said he's going to come from the Roman Empire, and he's going to come from part of the Grecian Empire. Well, by saying these things, those empires overlap in a particular area that's right there in the Middle East. And then Isaiah calls him... Assyrian. So you get multiple prophets talking about the same person. Now there is more than one Antichrist. The, you know, they make that clear in the Bible too. The Apostle John talks about it. Yeah, but there's, there's multiple one main one. But there's gonna be one uh prominent figure, you say. Yeah, one prominent one. And or actually arguably two. Uh two heads of the same beast. So one of the heads will be slain, uh, but the other one will still be remaining intact so it's uh i interpret that to mean uh sunni and shiite mm. two factions and they're going to end up combining into a master caliphate in the end times uh, and there's going to be wars and stuff and i was talking about this 20 years ago that the end in the middle east is just gonna explode you got an area that's covering like 40 countries it's going to reduce to about like 10 countries and the only way i know of to do that is war a lot of it unless you get peace treaties and they peacefully unite which is pretty unlikely right and uh, you and you've seen putin you, you've seen his comments lately threatening the west with more mm -hmm. nuclear weapons and you know i always i'm on i'm on the the, the impression of uh go ahead bring it i don't think you're going to do anything you know we have advanced weaponry far beyond your capabilities right now even though he believes that he has an edge on us in the terms yeah. of modern technology, but I beg a differ. Um, what do you think about that, though, John? Who knows what the heck technology we have or they have at this point? Yeah, we um, don't exactly know what they got, but I know we have we're something pretty wild stuff that we got from somewhere else. Yeah, um, it's it depends on who's gotten farthest on their reverse engineering efforts, um, and these reverse engineering efforts have been going on since World War II. That's right, and. Uh -huh. 
that, you know, that brings another topic up as as we go along here. You know, there's a large group of officials at the Pentagon that believe aliens are demonic entities. And with mm -hmm. all the UAP, I wrote it. yeah, all the UAP UFO, I, I prefer to say UFO. I don't like UAP. Yeah, I'm, I'm old school. They, I, they, they rebranded it just to try to give it more legitimacy. Right. So won't make fun of them. I get that, but I, I, I don't really care. I rather say flying saucer, to be honest. I'm even that mo yeah. I'm even that old school. I like that way better. Or non-human biological entity. Yeah, like, I mean aliens, right? Yeah, that's <laughs> kind of it's a little silly. It's it's a little pretentious in my opinion. But yeah. yeah, there's a lot of people out there in the Pentagon that believe these things are demonic. Uh, what do you make of that? Do you think that they are demonic? So there's there's four primary groupings that I, I classified in the, the book, um, The Strong Delusion, and I also mention it in, in uh, Christian ufology. This, the first group is uh, Christians that are saying that, you know, this it's just all hoax. That nothing is really out there, and, you know, it's just this demonic hoax. Right. It's the second group is, oh, there's something really there, but it's all demonic. The third group, probably the least or the most unusual and there's a couple of examples of this group that date back starting in the 60s um, um what's his name dr barry downing uh, wrote a book called uh, the flying saucers in the bible and he believed that they're divine manifestations and he was reading this in uh job or not job uh, Ezekiel chapter one, Ezekiel chapter ten, the wheels. Yeah, the wheels. Ezekiel's it's wheel. A divine manifestation. Right. You know, the Mertaba in uh, Hebrew, God's portable throne that would appear above this thing. Um, and uh, and then he also talked about the the cloud of fire. Right. Uh, at day in the column of the column of fire at night and column of cloud at day that. Um, was with Israel when they protected Israel from the uh, uh, chariot army of Pharaoh when he was chasing them down. And then Moses touched the staff to the Red Sea, the sea split with this giant column over the sea, which the ancient astronaut people, they love this stuff because they're like, that's, that's not God, that's an alien. It's like, they wait a say minute, that wait all the time, yeah. Um, I'm not saying that that's not aliens, you know, that that. That is clearly an extraterrestrial spacecraft up there. But my take is it's piloted by angels, and God delegated that authority to them. God didn't create the universe and everything in it so he can micromanage and just go personally doing all of these little things. He delegates. He even delegated this whole planet to Adam and Eve. He said, you have dominion over the planet. Done. And then he popped back in every now and then, see how things were going. So this is God's way. You know, and it's very clearly established in the Bible again and again and again. God, all the prophets of the Old Testament, half of them didn't even want to do it. Moses was like, I, I can't do it. I, I got a speech impediment. Get my brother to do it. So God's like, no, I want you to do it. So God uses people, and he also uses angels the same way, but he's very personal. So maybe God popped up. He showed up. He was inside of the spacecraft with the angels when they parted the Red Sea. This anti-gravity beam shot down, and boom, splits the Red Sea, and they cross. You know? Then the Egyptians come across, and then boom, trash the entire army. You know, And then they fed the, the Israelites out in the desert for 40 years, raining this manna from the sky. I think that food was manufactured by this, this column, this obvious craft up in the sky. And these are glorified manifestations. So that's one of the camps, but then there's the other camp. I don't think that the, uh, I believe both. The fourth, the fourth category, they're not all demonic. They're not all good. They're both. The Bible's very clear. There's good and bad angels. There's a war in the heavens. Right. It's actually cut loose a long time ago. Isaiah chapter 14, Ezekiel 28, actually says that Lucifer once had an angelic kingdom on earth, that he walked in the Garden of Eden, and he was a king because he had a throne. So he couldn't have been here at the same time as Adam and Eve because Adam and Eve were given dominion over the earth. So he can't be like a king while Adam and Eve are in charge, you know. Um, 
So this all had to happen before Adam and Eve were ever created, along with the rebellion. I mean, all these angels were created, and then they lived in peace and harmony throughout the universe for who knows how many eons. Job 38 talks about that, that there was a time before Lucifer sinned, when all the angels sang and they were being giving glory to God, and we had this awesome universe, and it was perfect. And it lasted, who knows, billions of years. And suddenly one of these angels decided, you know, what if we decided not to do what God said? Maybe, maybe I would make a better, uh, you know, do a better job being in charge of all of this. Now the fallen angels, yes. Yes, and Ezekiel 28 says, Lucifer walked amidst the stones of fire. So we're left with this phrase, stones of fire. What's, what's that? Are these pebbles, glowing pebbles on the ground in the Garden of Eden? Well, it, Lucifer's an archangel, and he has this kingdom that is so vast, you can't even comprehend it. Uh, when we look out in the cosmos, we see these structures on Mars, evidence that there used to be oceans there, probably an entire civilization that was once there. Yeah, Dr. John Brandenburg says there was a, an mm -hmm. atomic blast of sorts there, that there's evidence yeah. of this. So my theory, I go off of Richard Hoagland's uh, exploded planet uh -huh. hypothesis. Hoagland? Yeah, that there used to be a planet uh, where the asteroid belt is, and Michael blew it up. The Archangel Michael blew it up. Oh, really? Boom. The Bible refers to it uh, with the word Rahab, which is an ancient reference. And they think most scholars say that that refers to Egypt as, you know, uh, where God did his punishment against Egypt. But I think it even predates Egypt. I think it actually refers to the original destruction of Satan's kingdom. It's also mentioned in Revelation. So, Revela or Genesis. Genesis 1 1 says, In the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. Done. They're created. They're done. That existed for how many eons with the angels before all humanity? And then Genesis 1-2 starts out by saying, and the earth became void and without form. When you actually look at the Hebrew of that, the word void refers to a destruction. It became destroyed is the literal translation. So whatever was here, God destroyed it. And he destroyed it so comprehensively that there was no sunlight. There was nothing. This entire solar system was obliterated. So what would blow up a solar system? To just completely shroud a solar system in darkness would be a planetary explosion. And chunks of that planet hit Mars. Boom. Life gone. Ocean blasted out into space along with the atmosphere. A chunk of it hit Saturn. So I don't know if you know about Saturn's rings and how they, they rotate, but you have the Earth here, and you have Saturn spinning around the Earth. You would think that the rings would be spinning like this, along with this, right? But no. Saturn's rings are like this. They're perpendicular. They spin like this while it's rotating. So something hit Saturn so hard, it knocked it at a 90-degree angle. So something hit Saturn, something hit Mars, something hit Earth. We know that there was this massive crater there. Uh, off the coast of Florida. It's about 100 miles wide. Uh, they think that that was the planet killer, the dinosaur killer. Uh, and in fact, uh, I read in a biology textbook that um, it looked like there was five mass extinction events that happened in Earth's ancient history, right. according to geog geography. I am an old Earth theorist because I understand now that sin existed before Adam and Eve. They didn't unleash sin into the entire cosmos of all creation. I believe sin was quarantined to Earth, that sin is quarantined to specific planets where it's unleashed, because it makes more sense that way, because sin existed with Satan before it existed with Adam and Eve. And there was actually a war in the heavens fought with angels and Satan, and that word heaven that the Bible talks about is defined in Genesis 1.14. It's the abode of the sun and the moon and the stars. The Hebrew word shamayim is a reference to outer space in most instances. It's used 567 times, and in almost every instance, it refers to outer space. So when you see terms like the host of heaven, it's actually talking about life and outer space, some of which is angels, and the Bible even goes into that detail. The Bible says um, what an angel is. It's a perfectly, it's, it's a being that has been translated to the highest form. It's perfectly immortal cannot die, it doesn't eat anymore. Um, Jesus 
talked about this in Luke 20, 36. But then there's these other beings like Adam and Eve. Adam and Eve, they didn't sin, but they were mortal, sort of. They had to eat something from the tree of life to sustain their mortality until they reached a point where they would be translated into this angelic form. And so if you take what happened on earth with Adam and Eve, and just imagine, this happened all over the cosmos. But there's many instances where they didn't sin. So they became angels. And then so you had these pseudo-angelic beings that are, you know, they're not, they're like Adam and Eve. They're perfect. They didn't sin. But they were mortal. They could die. They could physically die. And you had these super powerful ones that they couldn't even die anymore. And you have different types of life all over in the universe. Uh, so some are like pseudo-immortal, others are mortal. So to say that the aliens and angels are the same thing, not necessarily true, because I believe that there are some angels or some aliens that come here that they're mortal. Uh, but others, the more powerful ones, are immortal. You can't even kill them. They're right. too powerful. And what do you so, make of the, the, the uh, Book of Enoch, though, about the fallen angels and yeah. how they are essentially pretty evil of sorts? They're the yeah. ones who brought corruption right. to uh, man and did all kinds of unsavory things basically oh so, yeah yeah the, the ancient alien crowd they'll talk about this genetic manipulation stuff just fine you know even though they like to say that that's the 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 aliens are manipulating our dna because they're trying to make us evolve to a higher level of consciousness right they say that yeah the the reality of that is god already has built into us a translation that will happen for those of us who accept him for who he is and accept ourselves and the universe and the place that we're created the way he intended, we will eventually reach a place where we will be transcendent. We will translate uh, into this higher form of angelic being. But we don't need genetic modification to do that. They're tweaking with our DNA now because they were tweaking with our DNA back in the days of Noah. And they created the Nephilim, these hybrids, they're part human, part something else. And these angels were experimenting with all kinds of things. I think the angels were shapeshifters, and they knew how to turn into animals, and they crossed with animals too. So you have this whole category of these entities. A lot of them have supernatural abilities. Some of them are what we call transdimensional. They could pop in and out of our reality because they have these powers. But if you've seen pictures of demons and stuff depicted... You commonly see them looking as a mixture of human and animal. Right. Like with horns it, it, It's interesting you know? because it's interesting you say that because that also brings to my attention of what the Middle Eastern folks call the, the jinn. And yes. uh, the, the greys also, or aliens in general, they all share that same characteristic of mm -hmm. sorts, which is quite fascinating to say the very least. Yeah. So Enoch says, and also the book of Jasher, that... Um, they also crossed with animals, and so they created this, all these different hybrids, part human and angel, which were the Nephilim with the you know, giants that we know of, but not all of them were necessarily giants. Some of them might have been just normal-sized person, but would have matched like Greek mythology. Right. Like Perseus, for example, and it's supernatural strength or whatever. By the way, do you believe uh, in, in Bigfoot, by the way? Just curious. Oh, yeah. Yeah. My dad actually heard him. My dad and my uncle heard one. Because they, you, by the way, your parents, your parents, they lived like out in the middle of nowhere, correct? When I lived in Arkansas, yeah, uh, we lived out in the woods. But it was on a camping trip that my dad and my uncle heard one. Oh, my. Um, but I, I had a friend who lived in Arkansas that had a major ordeal. Uh, you know, I love um, camping out here. We, we love yeah. camping out here in California, too, by the way. So, you know, I, I'm always thinking about Bigfoot <laughs> when I'm out there. Yeah, according to his story, which he verified old when he was older, and I, I got a hold of him again. I somehow tracked him down, and I said, dude, were you just BSing me? I mean, we were in high school when you told me this stuff. And he said, no, that story is absolutely 100% true. Oh, my. Where uh, he was, he and, him and some friends were dropped off in the woods when they lived in Arkansas, and um, they were deer hunting, and um, they shot a buck, and a Bigfoot took their buck. He was looking through the microscope or, you know, through the telescope of the, the weapon uh, while the others were making their way to it. And this, this thing just was so quick. It just stepped into the clearing, grabbed this 12-point buck with one hand, just flopped it over his shoulder. Mm. You know, yeah. 500 pounds maybe. 
uh, and just disappeared. And they were like 10 feet away from this thing. And they're like, he was like totally stymied. Like, how in the world did you not see or hear that thing? Um, so they decided to hunt whatever took the buck. Mm. And get a good clear shot, at, <laughs> a clear look at what it was. But he's like, no, we're going to hunt this thing down. You know, this thing, ain't whatever it was, it took our buck. You know, it's going down. It's going us. down. Yeah. Uh, so they broke up into two teams. That's so and funny. This thing was this thing was toying with them. They could hear it walking. They could smell it on and off. This thing smelled raunchy, really bad, like a dead skunk. Um, and it followed them around, messing with them the whole time. And then when they went back to their camp, they had all their gear netted up and up in a tree. Something climbed the tree and slashed their net. Uh, cans of beans they found were like ripped open in half and eaten. Uh, so something had grip strength to be able to take a can of beans and just rip it open and uh they were like freaking out like what the hell is this you know um uh they never found it but this thing was taunting them the whole time just walking around them and stuff uh and they couldn't understand how something that big could be like right there and move around like uh, that yeah and move around them and not be seen wow uh it was dense forest but you know so the, the highlight of it was pretty wild. they stayed awake they created this huge bonfire and uh, the guy that was up on shift in the middle of the night had to go to the restroom really bad, number two. So he goes over a little ways away from the bonfire, leans his weapon against a tree, drops his pants, and he's right in the middle of dropping the deuce. Uh, this thing just stepped right in front of him. And he's like, where the hell did this thing come from? It was just like suddenly there in front of him, staring at him. And he's in his most vulnerable position. He, he's like, should I try to get the weapon? And while he's thinking, you know, like, what do I do? Well, I can't even imagine. It, it reached down and grabbed his rifle, snapped it in two like a twig, and slammed it down on the ground right at his feet, and then stepped off into the woods and disappeared. Just like that. And your friend was still just, just like sitting that. there. Like, you're going to be in my house hunting me? That's pretty offensive. You're a sitting duck. I could totally rip your head off, you freaking pinhead. And he just snapped his gun in half and and threw it on the ground like it's disgusting. That was an act of mercy, in my opinion. He could have left them <laughs> uh, like Elvis. It was. I'm like, that Bigfoot was freaking cool. Yeah, man. he could have left them dead <laughs> and, and, uh, on the yeah, toilet, the guy, I'm telling you. Yeah, the guy probably crapped all over himself after <laughs> that. You know, was, he made it back to the camp, woke up the other campers, you know, and, and uh, they were all freaked out. Built this huge bonfire and then you kept it going for the rest of the night. Nobody could sleep. Um, but it, it didn't come back after that. It just made its point. Like, this is my place and you better take this warning. And they never went back there again. So um, I thought that was a pretty funny That's story. That's pretty interesting, it yeah. Explains a lot of things and it wow. sort of supports a theory of mine that I believe the Bigfoot is a, a class of Nephilim. Uh, I believe he's high functioning like... Um, Maybe probably has supernatural ability. Maybe I mean, there's all kinds of stories of seeing a Bigfoot and UFOs around the same, basically mm -hmm. the same time. There's a lot of stories like that. Yeah, so the Bigfoot might be uh, like a angel gorilla mix, something like that, um, where they're they're just monkeying around with genetics. I think a lot right. of what they did was just monkey around with the genetics to see what they could create. But I believe the ultimate goal of all this genetic engineering is to find out the most dominant traits so it sort of feeds into that idea of oh they're trying to create a better version of humanity well in terms you know? of ai yeah we're going to see in our lifetime even john i believe if we live the next maybe five ten years here we're going to see man all basically merge with machine even though we already have but we're going to be going like full scale merging with machine like yeah. our consciousness being downloaded into a machine of sorts because uh, another, as you know uh, billionaires as you know john billionaires th they want to live forever mm -hmm. so they're investing everything into what's going on right now with in terms of technology yeah. you know you're seeing the apple pro or whatever it's called and that's yeah. that's it's pretty light compared to what we, we probably already have but it's oh, yeah. but for the mass consumption we, we're still a few years away i, I think before we fully get in there. Yeah, and uh, yeah, it's 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 interesting that you mentioned that. 
uh, because that's yet another sign of prophecy because Revelation 13 actually specifically mentions AI, um, the image of the beast. So I did a study of the image of the beast mentioned in Revelation 13. This is a, a man-made thing. So the Antichrist himself will issue a command, you know, oh, you, you are to build this thing. Uh, and then what's the first, first function of this, this man-made thing? That it can think, it can talk, it can operate independently. So it's Immortality, sort of described, yes, people like have had these antiquated pictures of, in their mind of a statue that somebody creates, like a, a mold of some sort, and then they breathe some life. Well, they breathe into it and it becomes alive. That's your fantasy genre, right? Uh, well, let's put on our sci-fi hat, you know? We are now literally creating uh, robots, androids. Let's say we just get better at doing that. Until we create, you know, somebody like on Star Trek, Data, and we breathe our life into him as in the form of AI, you know, we're replicating what God does uh, in terms of creating new life that we think is superior to us. Uh, so in a way, uh, in a manner of speaking, it's blasphemy. You know, it's, it's trying to play God and releasing this thing, if it has any kind of free will, you're looking at a, ter a Terminator scenario. Um, and people that have been look, uh, you know, working in the field of AI for a long time, you know, I even wrote about it 20 years ago, uh, seeing this, and that the uh, cosmos, they call them the cosmos and the uh, terrestrialists, you know, two, two fields of thought concerning AI. One is that AI will, will become ad advanced and because it's not limited uh, with respect to uh, a biological in limitation, it could just go out in outer space, explore the cosmos indefinitely, and keep growing and expanding, finding resources and building on itself. You know, and there's there's no need. Why why would it need to stick around here and compete with us? The the terrestrialists are of the opinion that AI will want to stay here and compete with us, in which case it'll eventually outclass us. Well, I mean, there was already a, there, there's already a, an interesting case already of a robot in Saudi Arabia, by the way, that's already getting me too uh, And I say that because wow. uh, this uh, robot actually was being interviewed and it reaches down with its hand and sort of smacks the woman's, doesn't really smack her, but definitely caresses her backside, if you know what I mean. Uh, mm -hmm. So, I mean, that's wow. pretty it's pretty funny that that happened, but also kind of wild that the robot would yeah. even do that. That's pretty interesting. But you could program these things to do a lot of things, and I'm not, yeah. I'm not surprised. They're well, not they really trying to life. meet to them, by the way. That's, that's a joke. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> um, they, they will mimic life, and like, they're currently already doing that. But the, the leading experts are saying within five years, we're going to be surpassed. Well, you know, you know what's going to happen, though. This is a little adult, but, you know, eventually that's what people want to do. You know, a lot of a lot of our friends in Japan, I'm sure, want to. Well, you can't stop it. Do a sex robot sort of deal. And that's already underway in the in the adult world. Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. I'm not even surprised. Uh, I, I knew we we're going to go there eventually. In, in the industry, though, uh, it can't be stopped. It's almost like the arms race, right? Once we came out with uh, nuclear power and, and the ability to blow each other up right a nuclear bomb uh it started an arms race because then we have to be able to say well you're not more powerful than me i, I could do just as much damage to you as you can to me so you don't right. hold that leverage over me well now in the uh, in the industry if you have ai in your business and you're competing with somebody who doesn't have it well you're going to way outclass them i mean it's ability to get work done uh, more efficiently, uh, way more productivity. Um, just you'll be way outclassed. It's a bit of a game changer. And even where I work now, I, I, I'm in, in cybersecurity and I work for the utility sector and I was assigned to the uh, generative AI uh, task force to you know research the uh, cybersecurity aspects of it, which there's a lot. Um, whoever created that Gen AI, Gen AI can, can create back doors uh, so, like, if you're using it to do programs, create programs, um, it's going to be 
quicker and uh, faster than you know we than be a programmer to would. That. Yeah, a human. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So it'll be able to spit out code left and right, and then they won't be able to say, you know, oh well, this is actually a backdoor that it created here. They won't uh, know. You mean like a remote access tool? Yeah, remote access or a Trojan tool, virus. Uh, Trojan viruses, malicious logic of some sort. That, I have a little uh, bit of fun with those back in the early days. Yeah. I grew up behind the computer myself, so I had a lot of fun with the uh, rat tools back in the day. Mm -hmm. The sub sevens of sorts, if you know what I mean. Oh, okay. So I'm quite okay. familiar. I, I knew that game quite well. Okay. I may or may not have, may, may not have uh, done a few things to some libraries in my school. I mean, I don't know. Uh oh. I don't know. Maybe. Yeah, it sounds like you predate me. Uh, but I, I, I do have. Uh, <laughs> I had some fun. I had some in, fun. Uh, cybersecurity and ethical hacking, so I could kind of. Uh, get an idea of what you're talking about. Nothing there. evil, nothing malicious, just all experimental. Right. Well, you're not going to be a hacker, or you're not going to be a, a white hat hacker unless you are a little in the gray. Right. Uh, that's what I heard. That's the only way you're going to learn. Um, but you have to be careful. Yeah, it, it's not a, it's not really a game to, to, right. It's not really a, a thing uh, for anyone to be doing these days. But yeah, those were different times. Those were early 2000s, I would say. Oh yeah, yeah. It's everything was wide open back then. I even made a web server where I worked at the, the base, the military base. So oh, okay. you, you had your own personal web server on a computer, on a military base, but it's accessible to the world. And no one, no one knew <laughs> much of anything back in those. It was the wild west, basically. It, it was. It was. And now you um, know why I didn't pay for my, uh, I didn't pay for the internet back then. Let's put it that way. <laughs> I knew a lot of numbers. And with AI these <laughs> days, it's like we're entering the Wild West again. Oh, yeah, stuff that's is true. Going to unlock capabilities that, you know, well, quantum computing can slice through encryption like nothing. Um, when you're talking about state sponsored hackers, there's nothing that they can't get access to. That's true. I mean, look at uh, Gary McKinnon, by the way. Mm -hmm. If you're familiar with him, you know, what he breached, uh, he's the British guy, or Scottish guy, I believe, actually. Uh, he. Basically, uh, was the you know, he's was guilty of uh, the biggest military computer hack of all time, if you remember. Oh wow! Yeah, okay. Gary McKinnon. If you look that up, he actually got in trouble for getting into uh, some really top, high level security of uh, uh, computers out there, really uh, for the government, and uh, was downloading all these uh, UFO files basically and saw wow. off world military officers. By the way. Gary McKinnon. Gary McKinnon. Look him up. He's old school, by the way. I'll have to look him up. And he did time for uh, this, by the way. Yeah. I, I know the guy who was on the task force who took down uh, Kevin Mitnick. Kevin Mitnick. So, that's another guy. I, I read his yeah. book back in the day as well. Uh-huh. So, uh, yeah, this, this guy, he now works. Um, yeah, I know a guy who was on that task force. Wow. And he also knew Ken Thompson and Dennis Ritchie, the, the guys who created Unix. Oh yeah, yeah, uh, it, yeah. It's amazing the the people that work uh, at, at Pacific Gas and Electric. It's like, wow, how did you get that talent? I mean, I would expect somebody like that to be with the CIA or something. Right, you would imagine that. Uh, they actually did uh, have the their former um, PSYOC director was a former CIA, so um, they get some pretty serious talent. They uh, really do. Uh, I would imagine they work for the Pentagon. <laughs> yeah. So that's like, uh, you know, Mossad. Pentagon probably doesn't pay as well. Uh, so they some work for uh, Pacific Gas and Electric. I mean, we all can work for Mossad. You know, we're not all Jeffrey Epstein. Right. <laughs> yeah. He got the big bucks, if you know what I mean. Yeah. yeah. We're in the wrong business, John. Oh, man. We need to be in the human well, trafficking I'm, I'm business, John. I'm, I'm joking, by the way. Yeah. <laughs> oh. Jokes for listeners, by the way. I'm joking here. Oh, what a what a weird world we live in, um, Mr. Myler. I think you can agree with me that the world is pretty much backwards. I, I mean, we have all these people out there in the suits telling us uh, lies, and we got to believe them and pretend that they are they're true. Yeah, common sense is gone. In other words, John, drink the Kool Aid, just shut up and do what you're told. That's what. Yeah, I, and John. Nothing going on here. By the way, I, I hate to even mention this thing to you here, but uh, back, uh, man. Uh, so um, I was fortunately able to get out. So that's what it did for me. It cut my military career short.
uh, but I, I wasn't going to tolerate that. That's respectable, and, uh, though. I, I really, my heart goes out to all the people that were there that took that going against their conscience. They didn't feel right about it. And, uh, and a lot of people had to, though. A lot of people had to bite the bullet and, and, and do it to save their, the family, their, their whatever yeah. that was going on, you know, their, their well, livelihood. Yeah. Which, you know, you read about that stuff in Revelation where it talks about, you know, it's a shadow, a foreshadowing of it. It's like people that are being coerced to take this mark, and then if they don't, it's death. Right. Uh, they're going in that direction. I mean, they, they, they have the technology for the, for the vaccine passport. They're pushing for this thing. They, don't, they want to lock you down and make your life miserable. They want to go to digital currency. That's a prophecy thing. You know, um, <laughs> trying to go to all digital currency so they could tr control everything that you do. So you won't be able to get paid. You won't be able to pay for your house or your, you know, your rent, your car. You won't be able to buy food. You'll end up being a homeless vagrant wandering around searching for food if you refuse to do what the government says, if they get their way with all the stuff they want to push. So um, That's true. I mean, look at that, the whole Palm Pilot thing at the those Amazon stores now, by the way. You just yeah. go in there and it reads your palm and you're good to go. You don't even have to bring any money. You already signed yeah. up. They already got all your information. Well, this right here, this is the precursor to yeah, the that, mark. Yeah, they already have all that. That's another thing you yeah. could say. Um, now we're all looking at just putting that into a chip and embedding it in you and then pretty trying much. to integrate it with your neural brain. And exactly. Then that's the goal, though, um, John, as you know. Yeah. That's the goal to live forever. You know, man meshing with machine. That's what it's all about. And eventually, as I said to you, and I keep saying this, I've been saying it for the for years now, eventually we will be me meshing with machine. And if you don't, it will be looked at like a lower tier scumbags, you're basically. You're a dinosaur. Yeah, you're just nothing. A low nothing. brow Neanderthal. Right. You, know, you, don't, you don't belong over here with, with us. Um, you need to die off. That's, what, that's what's going to happen, I believe. Go the way of the dinosaur, and I'll be like, that's fine with me. I'll That's be like fine, that little yeah. meme. I don't know if you've seen that meme. There's these two little dinosaurs on this tiny little island, and it's all this water, and then you see a boat in the distance with all these animals on it, and uh, the dinosaurs are like saying, "Oh crap, that was today." <laughs> <laughs> That's pretty. <laughs> they good. missed the boat. <laughs> That's pretty good. You know, speaking of missing the boat, eventually <laughs> there will be a time when humanity has to face that crisis of uh, getting off this planet, perhaps because either a comet or a sun. It's going to devastate the world, and you have a chance to maybe go off planet somewhere. I feel like eventually that's probably going to happen at some time. As scientists have predicted, perhaps the sun will be the first to give in and end uh, end of all humanity here on Earth. Basically, um, if if let's say we had a time machine of sorts in a perfect world, in a sci-fi perfect world, let's say uh, we reach that time, uh, John, and you were given that opportunity to leave this planet and colonize somewhere else uh would you take that opportunity uh opportunity john or would you just rather go down with the ship per se um so it's a interesting question um if i was allowed to go somewhere to another planet with my family i'd probably want to go just because i'm an explorer right um same here i'm i'm told that i am related to mary weather lewis uh, really? Lewis and Clark expedition. Yeah, yeah that yeah, he oh. had a. Um, so I tried to trace it because, like, my uncle was mm. named Paul Lewis, you know, after Mary Weather Lewis. So th this, this uh, information, mm. my Maybe great grandmother, it's it's through her family, um, that there's a a branch of Lewis's, and we traced it on Ancestry dot com. But anyway, uh, it's in my blood for sure. The desire to explore. Because, uh, you know, I've always wanted to go to unknown places and travel. Hey, you, you know. seem like the explorer type to me. That's part of why I used to experiment with astral projection. But I, you know, had some experiences there that were like, uh, A little too much. Know. It's like a little kid playing on the freeways with that. I see, yes. You pretty much, uh, pre you pretty much uh, put those shades down, like in the movie They Live, as we <laughs> talked about. You know, if you're doing psychedelics... You really yeah. get a look behind the curtain sometimes. Yeah. So, uh, but it, honestly, the Bible describes a pretty amazing future. Um, so, you know, most of us know about the, the apocalypse and they've heard the Battle of Armageddon. And by the way, in, in regards yeah. to drugs, in relation to what you're saying, 
some scholars believe a lot of these visions were a product of hallucinations from different uh, plants that would cause hallucinations of, of sorts. The, in other words, they were using drugs. So you go without se. eating for 40 days, you might see something. You, yeah, exactly. You could hallucinate and have these visions of sorts. But yeah, a yeah. lot of scholars say that you know they, they use these properties. Yeah. And there's evidence of that they absolutely did. It's been going on for since the earliest well, of times. And, and I could tell you that now, you know, I'm an avid faster. I, right. Uh, I, I do that as a regular. Well, that's very Muslim regular, of you, John. And uh, the veil gets still. Uh, did you, did you miss that, uh, John? I said, yeah, that's very Muslim that? of you. Oh, <laughs> well, I mean, uh, that's that's multiple uh, religions. I know, I know. I'm I'm, I'm joking with you. Uh, I'm sorry if your jokes just fly over. My head. <laughs> no, no, I'm 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 just joking with you. Playing around here. That's that's the thing. I saw another one and I just stayed quiet. By the way, <laughs> I, I'm just like I I can't bring it up again. Uh, there, there are, there's something, room. I don't uh, know what's going on uh, in your room there, but you no, know, there's some trails of light going on. Yeah. I, I think I have company when I do these interviews. It's pretty fascinating. So, yeah. We're getting a lot of here. I do believe that I get visits from, from, uh, family members, but they're not from down there. They're from up there. Some would say, well, that's just a spirit trying to trick you, John. Oh yeah, spirits yeah. aren't supposed to be oh, talking to you. Satan masquerades as yeah. an angel of light, and right? Just trying to deceive you and whatnot. And I'm like, okay, so so why does Satan get all of this authority and power, but God's good guys don't get any? He's telling yeah. me I can't get saved by an angel. Good, I mean, I yeah, should have been dead thirty times over. I could tell you all these near death experiences that I've had in my life, many many times, unusual amount that I've brushed death and walked away from it. And I believe that there's angels around me all the time. And they've saved my skin too many times for me to, you know, just dismiss. Well, here's the thing. Yeah. What's interesting. I'm, I'm seeing these uh, very bright uh, trails of light that were going over you. I saw like two or three of them during this interview. Very, very bright. And it, it's strange because uh, there's an acquaintance of mine. But I can't really say he's like a friend of mine, per se. It's just I, I kind of have randomly knew him or known of him through like school and that sort of deal. Mm -hmm. He kind of went the he kind of went to the dark side, literally, meaning he yeah. became like a like a, a dark priest of like Satanism sort of a thing. And he has his own coven and uh, he what? he's into all this sort of stuff and. He has like his own coven and his own like group and he has these videos online by the way john I could even show you them where he's doing these wow. tarot card readings and all this jazz well i'll say i'm a christian mystic but um, well, he, well here's here's what i'm getting yeah, at but i i don't get into divination and things like that well he's very deep into all this stuff but here's the thing uh, as he's recording and doing this you you could literally see like this black orb manifest and sort of goes down and, and literally hits the, the his phone that was set up and knocks it over. And this is a guy who's not tech savvy. He he's kind you know he's kind of an idiot. And yeah. uh, but that yeah. thing appeared. I'm telling you, it was pretty crazy. And it was like this dark ball, a very. Yeah. It, it didn't look very good. It looked rather nefarious. Oh, he's playing on the freeway. These people, they don't know what they're doing. So I'm, I'm like, I'm coming. So what I saw above you was like a bright light, and what I saw from him was a, such a black, dark uh, ball of light. And I'm just thinking about both incidences right now, and yeah. uh, I don't even know what the hell to say about that. To be honest, that's kind of crazy to me. Here you have well, like this, this yeah. nice sort of energy. He has this dark energy. It's, it's pretty fascinating. Mm -hmm. Yeah. I course. wonder what that means. Mm -hmm. Well, I probably have angels here with me. I did ask God to help me for the interview. Um, so, as I do with all my interviews, I pray before and uh, I try to represent as good as I can. So, uh, maybe we're actually seeing some signs of that. I, I, I have no idea what that was. I, I would have to agree with you here to some extent, uh, just yeah. just by seeing this. Uh, <laughs> uh, who knows what that was? Maybe you're right. But we do have the so, evidence. Yeah. And we've seen some, I've seen, I've had a lot of uh, interesting things. Like I said, I, I've had things following me my entire life of, you know, my life is kind of like an uh, episode of X-Files because it's 
like with that ball of energy I saw in the jungle, that wasn't just all of it for me. I've, I've actually gone to exorcisms before. Um, yeah, you've done an exorcism. House. Yeah. Can you can you talk to us a little bit about that? I know we're kind of running out of time here. I didn't want to hold you okay. up too long, but yeah, tell me a little bit about this exorcism. Yeah. Um, uh, that's quite interesting. So, this was a person that I knew who was uh, could exhibit supernatural abilities, psychic abilities. Uh, for example, I was talking with this person on the phone once, and uh, the person stopped talking mid sentence and said, "Somebody's listening to us," and uh, I thought he meant like picked up the other phone in the house. It was a landline back then. Um, I said, no, I know what that sounds like. When somebody picks up the other line, you could hear it. And uh, the person said, uh, nope, somebody's listening to us and uh, they're overhearing the conversation. I don't want to keep talking to you until, they're, until they leave. And right at that point, a hand put on my shoulder and I jumped and turned around and uh, I had my roommate who was downstairs, sneak up the stairs into my bedroom upstairs and sneak up behind me and was listening to our conversation. And he was tripping out because he said as soon as he got where he could hear me clearly, yeah, sneaking up behind me, he said that's when I stopped talking and said, no, nobody's listening to me. But So this person on the phone knew that this somebody had been sneaking up behind me and was listening in on our conversation. So that's just one example of what this person did that showed me that there was something real about this person. But it came out later on, uh, this is about the time that I, that God gave me a vision and showed me, you know, hey, uh, I am real and you need to turn your life around or you're going to end up in a bad place. So he basically gave me a vision on that. So I really flip-flop. I turned my life upside down. It's just completely... So some of the stuff, I mean, that's how I became... To this a point Christian in time, yeah. I, right? yeah, because I knew all of this encyclopedia of paranormal stuff, but then now I'm like a believer, right? And I, I'm like really firmly on board with like, where do you want me to go, Jesus? Uh, what do you want me to do? Okay, I got to get baptized, I got to go to church, I got to do that, I got to read the Bible, you know, all these things, right? Um, so I was trying to get serious about God at that time of my life, and I met this person, this friend, during that time. So every time I would bring up Jesus to this person, he would get angry. He would suddenly change. You know, even just saying the name Jesus would set him. Would invoke something. <laughs> and okay. at one point, I'm like, why are you getting all upset? You know, I'm just telling you what happened to me, uh, something that happened to me. And I mentioned that name and um, started talk. this person started talking in a different voice. And uh, multiple voices coming out of the out of the phone while I'm on the phone. And um, then it, the voice was really deep too. So it just didn't sound normal. I'm like, what is this? I said, in the name of Jesus, I command you to come out of that person right now. And, you know, just yelling at the phone. And uh, the phone dropped to the ground. Uh, kind of some weird stuff happened after that. This person ended up going to the hospital. Um, like, uh, was dealing with all kinds of different psychological issues. Um, but he said that uh, after that conversation, he w was wandering. Leading up to that conversation, the person was attacked and beat up. Um, his face was full of bruises and cuts, right? And he was crying and telling me, like, oh, yeah, this all this crap happened to me. My life is just going to crap. So that's why I was talking to him about Jesus. And I said, well, how about I pray for you? And then all of a sudden, you know, all this other stuff happened, and I commanded this thing to leave, right? The person totally flipped out because he said he went and looked in the mirror and all of the cuts and bruises, and they were gone. He was instantly healed. Um, and then he was just flipping out. So that, that was the, um, the exorcism that I did on that occasion. And uh, the... the I wanted to get the like hospital record. Like, do you have receipts of that? I mean, I, I want to see that. I, I want to have actually some physical verifiable evidence that these things happen instead of you just telling me that this happened over the phone. But um, I have no reason to believe that this person lies. This person's still a really good friend of mine and still holds to that story that these cuts and scrapes and stuff were just completely healed instantly. And... Uh, that that happened at the same time that I, I cast this thing out. 
And this person also has this whole list of things in his past. Uh, his uncle was a Satanist. And uh, when he was a little kid, took him to his church where the people were like worshiping this pentagram on a wall. And he was just a little kid and he started yeah. laughing. And was like, what is this? You know, and it, his uncle freaked out and took him out of there and said, you do not make fun of this. Where these <laughs> people are here. Right. Yeah. So I think he might have just, you know, his uncle screwed him over is what happened. Hmm. Probably these people or whatever was in there latched onto him and freaking made his life a living hell. At one point, he was abducted by this psychopath, uh, was torturing him when he was a kid, and just all of these problems. Man, it was a this person's life was just really hard. Yeah. Um, <clears throat> and and that was in El Salvador, you know, where this kid was raised, and you know, war torn country. He lived there during the war, so already, you know, there's that trauma too. You know, said it would, wouldn't be uncommon be driving on a school bus, going to school, and see a dead body hanging from a bridge. You know? Yeah, that could really a, uh, mess with your head. Playing at a sure. playground and see a dog jog by with, yeah. a dog, with a person's hand in its mouth, you know? And that, so those kind of things were like commonplace. Uh, but then to be abducted by a psychopath, you know? Yeah, that's probably, next level. Because you know, they have a lot of them there. Uh, a lot of it came from the war. They, they would take, abduct kids and then treat them, train them to be brutal killers. Uh, and um, that's how they you know, would get their refreshment of troops. Um, both sides were really bad. The official government, the things that they did were bad. Some of them were just thugs, you know, rape and pillage. And then the, uh, I think it was the Contras and the Sandinistas, um, you know, they're both just as bad. And they do all these things. And so he had all of these things going on, but then there was a supernatural element too. Um, they lived near this, this uh, jungle enclave um on the outskirts of town and uh there was these things down there that they would see uh this demonic things um <clears throat> a spirit called the chicken foot lady the chicken foot lady <laughs> i like that yeah it's just What's a that beautiful about? woman appears a beautiful woman would seduce people um her uncle saw this her mom saw this so my mother-in-law said she saw this chicken foot lady this this beautiful woman but the legs like part way down at the knees and going down to the feet uh -huh. it get scaly and then yeah. it would look like chicken's feet. So basically a Nephilim, <laughs> mm -hmm. you know, uh, that was still in existence there, this demonic thing. Um, so the word demon, by the way, uh, in Hebrew translates as uh, Raphaim and it means shades and spirits. And it's the same word that's used to translate for giants. So that's how you know what a demon actually is. It's not a fallen angel. A demon is the ghost of a Nephilim, according to the Hebrew language. So that's part of what I learned. And you know, she, she was seeing these actual demons when she was a kid. and Or no, um, he was seeing these demons when he was a kid. And then uh, these demonic things in the family uh, were, were part of his childhood. And uh, not to mention the war and all that stuff. So this person had all these problems. And yeah. Stuff. And so I was in a yeah, you conversation hear about these with individuals. him on the phone. Yeah, <laughs> yeah I was yeah. on a conversation with him on the phone. And I already knew this person was really unusual because of these supernatural things that followed him around. Uh, and then lo and behold, you know, uh, before I knew it, I'm doing an exorcism. So Damn, yeah. You know, yeah, it's interesting yeah. because you do hear of stories of people that uh, later on in life, they'll tell you that, you know, they grew up and they would see these things uh, when they would go to sleep or they'd see them just in anywhere in, in general. Mm -hmm. And, you know, you don't, you don't want to talk to this person. Mm -hmm. I would talk about Jesus. The phone would get all staticky. Oh, wow. Hang up, and then I'd call the person back and it would do it again, kept doing it. And then one time when I hit redial and went 666 on the display. And then my house turned into Poltergeist Central, all kind of crazy stuff. I wake up in the middle of the night, my bed's shaking around. Like, man, uh, I, I didn't have this kind of craziness happening. And when was this? Uh, when was this, by the way? Um, how long ago was that? So this was this was shortly after I got out of the army. I was 21 years old at the time. I see. And, uh, so I went into this downward spiral at that time something attached itself time. to you john it sounds like crazy partiness and then i was doing ghost hunting and playing with ouija boards and tarot cards and um 
I even tried to do, uh, I had a book on how to be a medium and I tried that. I did uh, mirror gazing in a dark closet. I just invited all kind of crap into my house. How to be a medium? Yeah, yeah, how to channel. Oh, okay, how to channel. Uh, not advisable. <laughs> Anybody can. <laughs> you don't want to do it, though. You don't want to do it. Uh, <clears throat> yeah, so um, I got all of that stuff busted off of me, though, when I, I, um, uh, I got baptized. There's a very powerful thing that happens in the rite of baptism that when you really mean it, when you're really serious and dedicated and you get baptized, it totally is spiritual warfare. That's a spiritual warfare thing. It just takes anything that you might have had attached to you and it <laughs> obliterates it. But then yeah. I went through this period shortly after that where it's like the blinders are off now, like the devil's no longer hiding. Uh, so like with most people, there's like demonic things that happen around us all the time. We we ignore it. We don't pay attention to it. We don't see it for what it is or whatever. <clears throat> you dismiss things, even though I was less apt to do so, but I was more curious. Like, I would want to see things, right? I would right. want to experiment. But then I, it's the blinders were off at that point. Then I started seeing things for what they were. And um, then that's all just when all this uh, poltergeist crap started unleashing. Oh, damn. House. I see. Yeah. I actually had to get the church to come to my house. They wow. came twice. They came well, twice to your house. They do an exorcism on the house. Wow. Yeah. That's pretty intense, John. Yeah. And then a buddy of mine, he got into ghost hunting. Oh, oh. And uh, I was advising him, dude. Don't, don't get do into that. it. <laughs> yeah, don't do because, it. Because uh, it, it was sort of my brand of Christianity. Is like I would talk to him about the reality of ghosts and the spiritual realm, which made him curious, but he wasn't a Christian, so he didn't really want to accept it. But he knew there had to be something. So he did ghost hunting because it really made him, you know, feel like, wow, this is something, there is just something really here going on. And I'm like, yeah, no kidding. You're messing with the dark end of it. You should get out of it. And until he ended up getting messed up, um, so like he takes medication now. His house got infested. His, he got divorced after that. Um, so all kinds of bad things uh, his happened to him. Apart. His life downward spiraled, yeah. yeah. Apart. interesting <clears throat> that yeah. sucks yeah that's <laughs> but, life you know that's life he's a believer, at, he's a believer hey, he, he wants to believe uh, and now he does believe yeah. yeah like the poster back there i want to believe and i set that last episode by the way oh yeah <laughs> great poster yeah it's iconic I, I like that and i got it for the background there because it's like you know what uh, i'm a christian who believes that those things are real now, whether that's a good guy or a bad guy, yeah, I don't, don't know. know. That's a question mark for me. But I am of the opinion that there are good guys out there too. And Re uh, Revelation 14.6 is a good guy. The Bible says that this angel is going to be flying through the sky preaching the gospel. An angel is going to be preaching the gospel from the sky. So how is that? The Bible tells us angels fly in chariots. Uh, I don't think it's some 2,000-year-old piece of technology with wheels if it can fly. And it says that the horses were made of fire. I think that they're just saying they didn't know what that propulsion was. That All they knew that is a horse pulls a cart, so maybe they're horses of fire, and that's the best they could put with their language to describe what they saw. But that's in Second Kings, and it's also in Ezekiel, uh, these angelic chariots. So I, I think it's interesting that a Christian will argue that there's no such thing as intelligent life in the cosmos when the word heavens means outer space, hosts of heaven means life forms in outer space, and these hosts of heaven fly in chariots. They use technology of some sort, so they're not like just omniscient beings that, you know, all powerful beings that can just pop in and out and do everything they want. They rely on a piece of technology to get them from A to B. Some of them do anyway. So there's enough clues there to tell you that there's good guys too. It's not all bad. Good guys too. Very nice. Now, John, I, I do want to thank you for being a part of the program. I could uh, easily do this a bit longer with you, no problem. And uh, I feel like we can uh, easily do a round two here, John, in, in the near future. Thank you very much. Oh, you're kind of uh, breaking up on me here. Uh oh 
Your sound is kind of breaking up a little bit, but uh, yeah, the sound is uh, breaking I do up. But uh, now, very much yeah, now I, now we hear you perfectly. Sorry, go ahead, John. Okay. Uh, I just thank you for having me on the show, and uh, and I had a great time talking with you. Very nice. Uh, do you want to plug your your website, John, before you go? Uh, okay, I, I have a couple of them. Uh, of course, my name, JohnMyler dot com. Uh, but um, I also have ChristianUFology.net and a strong delusion.net, aliens in the antichrist.com, aliens in the bible.com. So, a uh, couple of websites out there. Uh, this one's my main one that you see uh, right there, JohnMyler.com. Very nice. <clears throat> Very and, cool. Uh, I also answer emails too. So, if you have anybody who wants to just email me and ask me questions or whatever. Uh, I'm always open to that, and I have replied to pretty much everybody. I'm still obscure enough to do that. Love Jay that. Myler, jmyler.com. Very nice, very nice. Once again, sorry, thank uh, you. Uh, oh. Sorry, sorry, uh, jmyler at yahoo.com. Oh, at yahoo.com, there you go. Yeah, jmyler at yahoo. Very nice. It's an honor and pleasure to have uh, met you here, John, and we'll do it again very soon, my friend. All right, thank you very much.